Welcome to yet another video from AcousticPC.com. My name is Viktor Mikalcevic and today I will guide you through on how to build an ultimate quiet gaming system. What is it that is required of such a system? Well, in terms of performance you definitely want to use the top-notch hardware available on the market. In terms of cooling, you want the high-end coolers with quiet fans, like the one that we have here. Now let us take a closer look at the components. At first let us take a look at the baseline of the system. In this case we will be using Zalman GS1200 case. This case is loaded with fans making sure that there will be outstanding air circulation. In addition it is also toolless which makes it very easy to work with. Here on top we have a 200 mm fan right next to the hard drive docking station. On the front we have three USB 2.0 ports, one USB 3.0, one eSATA. In addition, we also have basic functions like reset button, power button, as well as mic and headphones. Now let us take a closer look towards the bezel. Here at the front bezel, we have four five and a quarter inch form factor slots, with one of them being able to switch to a 3.5 inch. Aside from that, we also have two 92 millimeter fans, beneath which a user will find uh, six, a total of six hard drive slots, three of which are hot swappable. If we take a look at, at this panel, you will also see another 200 millimeter fan. Now let us take a look at the inside of the case. The nice feature of this case is that all the fans already come pre-installed. Here at the back we have a 120 millimeter exhaust fan. Beneath it we have seven potential PCI Express slots, all toolless. The power supply slot located below where the accessory box is currently positioned is also toolless and the screws are located on the back. For the motherboard tray, you will find that there is a cutout for the motherboard tray and which makes it very convenient for cooler placement. Over here, you will find four cable management holes. In addition, these are pre-installed screws for easy installation of five and a quarter inch drives. To get the highest performance, we have chosen the latest processor and motherboard available on the market. For the processor, we have chosen Intel's Core i7-2600K. The nice feature about the latest K series is that it can be easily overclocked. For the motherboard, we have Z68X UD7B3. This is considered to be Gigabyte's flagship motherboard. Some of the nice features of this motherboard include Intel's Smart Response, which helps combine HDD and SSD for better performance by caching the most used applications to the SSD. Unfortunately, we will not be using uh, this particular feature because our SSD is uh, actually 128 gigabytes. Another important feature of this motherboard is uh, the ability to support NVIDIA's 3-way SLI, which is especially important for gaming. Finally, this motherboard has a lot of high-quality components like Japanese capacitors and driver MOSFETs. For memory and storage, we'll be using Patriot's Memory Gamer 2 Series DDR3. Altogether, we will have 16 gigabytes in our system running at 1600 MHz. For storage, We'll be using Zalman Stop Notch and Series SSD, 128GB. In addition, for additional storage, we'll be using two 1TB Western Digital Drives in RAID 0 configuration. Aside from the processor, the graphics card is also an important factor in gaming performance. For our gaming system, we'll be using two NVIDIA's GTX 580s. Aside from being the fastest single GPU card, on the market as of summer 2011, it is also one of the quietest cards. To ensure proper cooling for our overclocked Sandy Bridge processor, we have decided to use Noctuous NHD14 cooler. This cooler comes with a six heat pipe dual radiator design, as well as two quiet fans, one 140 millimeter and another 120. To complement our quiet Noctua CPU cooler, we will be using ultra soft silicon acoustic fan mounts for the rest of our fans inside the case. This is done in order to absorb unwanted vibrations caused by the spinning fans and therefore lower the acoustic levels. 
In addition, to make our installation of the CPU cooler even simpler, we will be using ArctiClean Thermal Material Remover and ArctiClean Thermal Surface Purifier. For those that are purchasing a brand new processor, it is recommended to simply use the ArctiClean 2 since there will be no thermal paste on the processor. Finally, we're going to lay um, the Arctic Silver 5 high density polysynthetic compound on our processor. In order to enhance our gaming experience, we'll be using high-end auxiliary items. Here we have Razer Imperator with 4G dual laser system and sensitivity of up to 6400 dpi. While 6400 dpi is not likely to be used, the ability to adjust the mouse's sensitivity dependent on the game may come in handy. In addition, this mouse has a 1000 Hz polling rate which provides an instant response in comparison to other lower tier mouses. For keyboard, we have chosen Thermal Takes Mecha G1 Mechanical Keyboard with yet again 1000 Hz polling rate. The advantage of this keyboard is not only its, uh, in its outstanding performance, but also its longevity. The nice feature of this keyboard is that each of the keys can be individually replaced after the extensive usage. In addition, each of the mechanical switches is estimated to have a lifetime of 50 million keystrokes, and which is almost 10 years of usage on a daily basis. Finally, we have here Razer Chimera 5.1 wireless headset. This is an outstanding choice, not only because it is wireless, it's also a surround sound, and it has a high quality noise cancellation microphone. Finally, we will be using Cooler Master's Silent Pro Gold 1200 watt power supply to make sure that our system is getting enough juice to run smoothly. Aside from the gold rating, this power supply, as the name implies, is quiet. In addition, it is also qualified for an NVIDIA SLI and has a 5-year warranty. Now that we have taken a closer look at our products, let's get to the assembly. At first, let's take a closer look at our motherboard. Here we have our CPU socket LJ1155, compatible with our Sandy Bridge processor. Right to the right of it, we have a total of four DDR3 memory slots, um, into which we'll be placing 16 gigs of memory. To the right of it, we have 24 pin power connector to power our motherboard. Right below here, we have four SATA 2 and four SATA 3 uh, ports. Right below here, we have our case connectors, such as power and reset. To the left of it, we have three PCI Express slots. Finally, in the back of the motherboard, we have a variety of ports that will be connected to the I.O. shield plate. Now, now let's take a closer look at the back of the motherboard. So here we have a total of 8 USB 3.0 backwards compatible with 2.0, uh, 2 LAN, 2 USB 2.0 eSATA, Firewire, Firewire Mini, audio ports, coaxial SPDIF, and of course PS2. Now let's get to putting the system together. At first let's place the CPU in our LG1155 CPU socket. In order to open the slot, simply apply pressure to the CPU socket lever handle while pulling it to the right of the slot. Then lift CPU socket lever along with metal load plate. Remove the CPU socket cover. Next, match the notches on the CPU with the notches in the socket and simply place the CPU gently into the socket. Make sure not to apply any additional pressure since that could potentially bend the pins in the socket. Finally, lower the CPU lever handle along with the metal load plate and return the lever to its original position. Now let's move on to the installation of DDR3 memory. First open the clips on each side of the memory slot. Notice that the notch for DDR3 memory is a little off-center, which means that memory can be placed only in one way. In addition, after placing the memory module into the slot, the clip should snap back in place automatically after applying just a little bit of pressure. Same can be done with all four memory modules. Prior to the installation of the motherboard, let us install the AO shield plate in the back of our case. This can be done by simply positioning the plate against the opening in the back of the case and applying pressure. Make sure also that the IO shield plate matches the ports in the back of the motherboard. The pins on the plate should fix the plate in place. Make sure to apply pressure in all four corners of the plate, making sure that the plate is secure. After the IO shield plate is installed, let's proceed on with the installation of the motherboard by aligning the motherboard with 9 already mounted screws. For those that do not have the motherboard tray screws already pre-installed, make sure to install before the placement of the motherboard. 
After the motherboard is positioned correctly, simply use the motherboard screws to secure the motherboard in place, like so. Make sure to get all 9 screws in order to ensure that your motherboard is secured once it is placed in upright position. Our next step is the placement of the power supply inside the case. At first let's remove the screws holding the back plate of the PSU slot on the chassis. After that is done, we will need to mount this plate onto our power supply. For the purposes of this video we will need a helping hands. There they are. Simply align the back plate uh, with the power supply and use the power supply uh, provided screws in order to attach uh, both together. Now that the plate is attached to the power supply, let's push it into the PSU slot on the chassis. At first what we want to do is push the cables through and make sure that they don't get stuck anywhere in the chassis. After that, simply uh, apply pressure to the plate and it should go in. Now that we see that it's stable, we're going to be mounting the screws back in. Uh, originally we had four toolless screws and uh, now we're just going to simply place them in. To remove any unwanted residue from the CPU, we're going to use Arctic Clean 2 uh, surface purifier. We'll simply place uh, one drop on the CPU, after which we're going to just clean it up with a towel. Like this. And as you can see right after we clean the entire surface of the CPU, it will ev evaporate right away. To remove any unwanted dust particles, we'll be using Extreme Clean Duster. After our CPU has been cleaned, let's place this cooler inside our case. Um, the way this is done is first we're going to have to place our um, back plate on the back of the motherboard because our cooler is rather heavy. At first we need to remove the rubber because it, um, we already have some leverage on the back of our motherboard and line it up with our motherboard. This particular um, back plate has compatibility for a variety of LGA uh, sockets. We're going to be using the one that is compatible with um, 11, LGA 1155. Alright, now we're just going to line it up, make sure that it's fit and stable, and we're going to place the rest of the screws in so that we can move on to the front. Now that we have our screws in place, we'll be placing uh, spacers over them. That is to give us enough room for the brackets. The brackets can go either horizontally or vertically, depending upon your preference. In addition, they can also be facing inward or outward. In our case, we'll be facing them outward because we're using Intel processor. To secure the brackets in place, we'll be using nuts to fix them. The nuts will be placed on all four sides. After the nuts are placed, we will secure them with a screwdriver. After we have set the baseline for our cooler, we'll be placing uh, Arctic Silver 5 thermal paste on our CPU. About one or two res drops um, is plenty to cover the entire surface of the CPU. In order to spread it, we'll be using a credit card. And we'll simply apply a little bit of pressure onto our drop and spread it throughout the um, CPU. After the thin layer of thermal paste is spread throughout the CPU, we are set to set up the rest of the cooler. Our cooler Noctua NHD14 is equipped with two fans which unfortunately obstruct access to the screws in order to mount this cooler. So we are going to have to remove these fans. In order to do so, we will simply unclip them. Noctua fans is really really easy to work with. Um, just like we did this with the outer fan, we can do the same with the inner. Now all we need to do is place the heatsink of the cooler inside the case. In order to do that, all you need to do is line up the screws with the brackets and secure them with a specially provided screwdriver. When placing the first screw, make sure not to screw it all the way 
in order to provide some level of adjustment in placement of the second screw. Our final step in installation of the CPU cooler is the placement of the fans back into their position. Once the clips are in place and the fans are attached to the heatsink, all you have to do is connect the three pin power cables to the motherboard. Our next step is placement of the hard drive inside the case. Installation of these drives is made easy by the tool's design of our GF1200 case. First remove the plastic cage, which you can see is just the right size for the 3.5 inch form factor drive. Then extend the cage by pressing the two buttons on the back of the cage. Next we will be placing the drive inside the cage, but prior to that make sure that the power and SATA ports of the drive are facing the back of the cage. Simply line the drive with the pins on the cage and close the cage. The cage is secured by simply sliding it in until it clicks. Now let's place our DVD player into 5.25 inch form factor slot. In order to do so we will need to push out the frontal mesh, which is held in place by the screws on the side. After the mesh is removed, simply slide the DVD drive towards the inside of the case. Finally, line up the DVD drive with the mounted screws on the side of the case and secure it in place. While the system is almost completed, all that is left is placement of the graphics card and the cable management. In this instance, since we are using a full tower case, fitting the card inside the case should not pose to be a problem. First we will need to remove the mesh on the back panel of the case designed for PCI Express slots. Simply use the screwdriver in order to remove the mesh, making sure that you have removed enough PCI Express slot covers in order to fit the graphics card. Now line the graphics card with the PCI Express slot and simply slide it in. Finally, secure the graphics card with the previously removed screws. If you decide to use a multiple configuration of graphics cards in SLI or Crossfire, make sure to link them with appropriate bridges. For the placement of cables and their management, please refer to the manual provided by the motherboard. After all the components were put in place and the extensive cable management was done, here we have our final system. Now let's get to testing the performance of our gaming system. For the purpose of testing we have closed the lid in order to see what real acoustic levels we're getting out of this system. Uh, in order to measure the acoustic levels we will be using the sound level meter. Uh, currently at idle, let's see, we're getting a reading of 43.3 decibels. How does that compare against my voice? Well my voice is should be about 67 decibels and obviously it's a logarithmic scale so that means that my voice is essentially a thousand times louder than the computer all right so in order to test the performance at first we will be running crisis 2 uh, the crisis 2 will be ran with the direct x11 uh, patch the latest one that just came out recently in order to test the maximum capabilities of our system Let's see. And then here up on top we have our fraps running just to see how much frames per second we're getting. Achieved with CryEngine 3. Alright, 
Under options here, we have maximum resolution 1920 x 1080, full screen, VSync no, the system specs are ultra, and the X11 is enabled. All right, now let's get to testing. We're going to be using campaign settings. Just load any random mission. At idle, we're still getting the 42.7, even with a little bit of load. Let's see. Let's silence this so we can see just how the acoustic levels will go up. As you can see, the acoustic levels are not going up at all. On average, we're getting about 88 frames per second right now. All right, so that's it for Crisis 2. Now let's get to uh, our next test, which will be yet another new game release, and that is Alice Madness Returns. In this case, since we're using uh, two GTX 580s, we'll take a full advantage of physics, NVIDIA's physics and just see how far we can push this. In addition, we have done some modifications to the basic game since uh, the game is made uh, to max out with a frame rate of 31. We have actually modified it so that it goes up to 120. Let's get some sound going. Just select some chapter. Let's see, no back. Just selecting one of the more graphic chapters, I guess. As you can see, at this point, we're getting a solid 120 frames per second and it's very very smooth. Let's read the acoustic levels. Turn off the sound maybe. <laughs> We're still getting 43.2. That's outstanding. Uh, let's see how well we... The response is really amazing as you can see. Even if we move the screen around, it's fine. In addition, the physics gives us additional effects like the smoke out of this pepper grinder, or for example, when we use a hobby horse, if we smash down to the ground, you can see the additional specks of the rock. Well, that's it for Alice. Let's get to our final test, which is the renowned Metro 2033. That, um, particular game is renowned because it is so stressful for the computer that not many gaming systems can actually run it on full load. Well, in our instance, we fortunately can. Let's see. Okay, let's go to our library. Sorry, let's get to options real quick. All right. So for the options, for video options, we obviously have DirectX 11, and under options, we're going with advanced depth, depth of field and tessellation. Resolution, obviously the maximum resolution for this particular monitor, 1920x1080. Quality very high, DirectX 11, anti-aliasing 4x, anti-sotrophy uh, anti 16x, and gamma just enough to see all the whites and the blacks. 
All right, let's resume the game, see how smooth it runs. As you can see, there is no motion blur, which is a nice sign that the cards are able to perform, nice, perform nicely. Uh, the level of detail, well, obviously you can see the DX11, you can see the depth of field, not as clear here, but once you get hopefully into the uh, volumetric, oh, the parts with volumetric fog, you will be able to see it clearer. In terms of acoustic levels, we're getting a 43.8 uh, just now. So that means that essentially we only went up two decibel throughout the three uh, benchmarks, three games that we ran, from um, idle at 42 to full load at 44. Now that this is really a quiet gaming system. All right, that's it. And now let's just run a DX11. Uh, I mean, 3D Mark 11, just to uh, see how well this uh, computer can perform. For our final results, we have received a, a total score of 11,592 for 3D Mark 11, and that is with our processor being overclocked at 4.8 GHz. Thank you for watching our How to Build a Quiet PC video. Feel free to leave comments as well as subscribe to our channel, which can be found in our description. If you have any questions, feel free to email at sales at acousticpc.com. If you have any questions about the hardware covered in this video, refer to our website at bjorn3d.com. Thank you.